Welcome to the podcast series Talking Success, connecting the global fintech community. I'm Stacey Jafta, and today I'll be chatting with Kelly Luca, Chief People Officer of Tabby. Tabby creates financial freedom in the way people shop, earn, and save by reshaping their relationship with money. Tabby lets you shop now, pay later, and earn cash without the interest, fees, or debt traps. Hi, Kelly. How are you? Hey, I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Good, good, good. So this is your first podcast. How are you feeling? Yeah, I think um, a healthy mixture of anxious and excited. <laughs> You're going to do great. You're going to do great. How's things been? Um, how's things at Tabby? Yeah, uh, very exciting. I'm about six weeks in now. So i um, definitely feeling part of the furniture and, you know, getting my <laughs> teeth into <laughs> a lot more kind of meaty topics. So yeah, it's going really well. Thank you. Okay, fantastic. I have a lot of questions about your experience at Tabby, but before we dive in, can you tell me more about your career journey and then what led you to become Chief People Officer of Tabby? Yeah, sure. Um, So I started my HR career actually in a bit of a specialist role. So I wasn't doing generalist. I didn't do the normal kind of, you know, I'll be an HR administrator, I'll learn the ropes and I'll kind of move up from there. I started more in um, HR systems and projects. And kind of looking at HR from a more process and functional um, lens, I guess. Um, So I did that in London. So I graduated from Kingston University and I worked in the city for the next kind of six years, really, six, seven years. um, And started working in uh, professional services, so legal. Um, And yeah, I was building kind of like my HRIS and projects kind of career from there. Um, And then as part of my role with them, I got an opportunity to move to Dubai. And I did that in 2012. And it was in a kind of that career move that really kind of changed my direction. So I was still in a specialist role for the first year or so of my role with Johnson Controls here in Dubai. Uh, And then I got kind of asked a question in one of my one-to-ones. It's like, you know, where do you see your career going? That, That famous question yes. do you want to stay in a you know more specialist stream or do you want to move over into kind of like generalist HR um, and I think it was probably one of the most pivotal questions in my career because I actually had to think about it and I knew that I wanted to not always work in large corporates mm. um, and I knew that if I stayed in a specialist role that that would probably mean I kind of did stay there because the more senior yeah. roles in specialist um, uh, functions don't really exist in such smaller organizations so I kind of made the jump and it was definitely a, a leap of faith at that time to move over into the more generalist stream and I've kind of been there ever since but Obviously, since then, I'd say the industries and the size of organizations have been what's been the differentiator for me. So I was at a large uh, engineering company at that point, and then I moved into a much smaller um, local company here in Dubai. So the entertainer, for those of you in Dubai who are listening, um, um, I was fortunate enough to get the kind of head of people there um when they were just coming out of their digital transformation and you know had grown massively in the in the in the region and throughout the world actually in different areas um and I really got to kind of I guess sharpen my saw there around being the senior HR person reporting into a CEO and and then began my love affair of that kind of dynamic where you're working in a tech organization with sales people mm. but tech people and c-suites and and kind of really growing companies and shaping the people function and and then I moved out of the entertainer and went to an even smaller organization in an even um earlier stage of their of their growth and worked for level which is a well-being company um and that again was super exciting for me because I guess from a people perspective but from a personal perspective perspective I got to learn a lot about you know that startup phase yeah um and then yeah I was with them for two years and and now I'm realizing where my sweet spot is and I think you know where Tabby is in terms of um funding and growth and headcount um I've realized that that's really kind of where I like to be in terms of like you know the late 200s coming up to three going to 400 employee group so yeah that's awesome. You don't come from a fintech background. Why do you think you specifically were right for this job? Yeah, um, I think 
the people function is probably one of the very few um I guess disciplines where companies don't always mind where you've come from um uh, particularly because people are people um there are always some nuances I think in different industries uh, but I also think the level that I'm at helps because you know I I've done tech um I know um <laughs> building a tech team I know building a sales team that has to go and sell that and and different things like that I think the yeah like you say the missing piece was just the fintech industry but I also think again that you know what we're trying to build at Tabby is not necessarily just um, a fintech organization for people from fintechs we're we're trying to attract you know talent and they can come from all different kind of walks of life and different industries yeah. and I'm a firm believer in that whilst industry is sometimes um, relevant, that it shouldn't always be your kind of deal breaker when when attracting and retaining talent. So luckily they took that approach with me as well. Awesome. What was the learning curve like? Yeah, I mean, it definitely had a gradient and continues to have one. Um, but I think for me it was um, learning again to think, um, you know, bigger picture, um, scale and growth because – uh, where when I was at level, whilst we were thinking in that way, we weren't um, at that point yet. You know, we were always thinking about scale and growth, but we just weren't growing at the rate Tabby is. Um, so I think for me, getting my mind back into that hyper growth phase, but also, um, again, another thing that I love to do when I go into business is really fully understand what the business is trying to do yeah. strategically. So that kind of learning curve is, yeah, obviously massive for me because I don't don't or haven't been in the fintech space before so just learning like what what are they talking about what's what are these acronyms these abbreviations so many so many these numbers exactly so so yeah so it's been it's been great though because I think I've done that so many times like learning different industries that I kind of you know know how to do that Still to this day, I have Google open because there's like a new acronym every other day that I'm like, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. Like I'm like Googling on the side. Um, but what, what is your way of getting up to speed? Were you reading? Were you listening to podcasts? Like what was your style? Yeah. So actually before joining, I asked a couple of my friends who are in, are in tech um, and they were really helpful for me because um, I think the business model was super important to me. I was um, working, as you know, for a well-being company before and then, um, you know, moving then into financial services or fintech or that financial kind of um, space was always a bit um I don't know, scary for me because I didn't want to go from, you know, well-being, well-being, including financial, which is something that I really, really believe in and then go into yeah. the, to the dark side of the financial <laughs> services industry. So for me, it was just asking and, and finding out a little bit more about Tabby in the region and the sentiment behind it and, you know, what what actually is buy now, pay later and how how do people use that yeah. to benefit their lives rather than not as sometimes I think the misconception can be. So I asked friends, um, yeah, I did my own Googling, as you said, and, and yeah. trying to find out a little bit more about that kind of landscape, particularly here in the Middle East, which is the big focus for Tabby. Um, and yeah, like then I think, you know, the algorithms come into play and every, <laughs> every article about a FinTech would be coming up into my stream and things like that. So I just read um, as much as I could, but equally, um, once I was in the business, I just asked. And I think, you know, um, everyone says it like ask questions, ask questions, but I don't think always people naturally do. But yeah. you know, I remember my first leadership call when, you know, they were doing their usual updates and everything and, and Hassan welcomed me. And then at the end, I was like, yeah, I definitely need to dig deeper into kind of what, every, what just went on there because, um, yeah. you know, some of those things I, you know, I didn't know whether that was good or bad, but it seemed great. So, um, you know, yeah, just asking questions and, and self-learning, I think just being open to not knowing is also another um, <laughs> piece of yeah. advice, really. Scott, could you design a video game? I could make you a hypothetical one. If I took some random genres, mechanics, maybe blended them together and uh, created a new hypothetical game. Now that would make a great podcast. Undoubtedly. So what would you make? Something original and exciting? 
a Dark Souls city builder, a co-op roguelike? Everything. All of that. You know, we could use the Nemesis system from a, and put it in a first-person shooter. And we could have a loot system with survival mechanics and, and motion controls. And maybe you could, oh, I don't know, save a kingdom from some out-of-control toasters. You know, uh, what about party? Catch the Gaming Blender on all your favourite podcast platforms. Um, it's really funny because when I like reconnect with my older cousins or, or aunts, they say that I was a really, really annoying kid because I'd ask why for everything. <laughs> They're like, yeah. you can't do this. Why? Have this. Why? And I'm still <laughs> yeah. like that to this day. I'm a very, I'm a very naturally curious person. Um, yeah. And I think that's a great, great way to learn. For somebody that's not in fintech right now, you're you're in the, the people space. What advice do you have for somebody being like, I I really believe in in what fintech is doing and how it's changing the world. And I'd, I would love to come in um, and be a part of this change. What advice do you have for them? Yeah, it's a great question, actually. Um, I think find a brand that you resonate with and, and feel passionate about, because I think with any kind of product, there are always alternatives, right? And I think looking deeper into, I think particularly in the fintech space, like what is this um, product trying to solve? And do I resonate with that problem? Um, and, and do I want to be part of that more importantly? So I think really kind of do your research around the types of companies in the fintech space, because I think there are some fintech products out there that might not be trying to solve problems that potentially could create, <laughs> create more. Um, I think also looking yeah. at kind of, um, you know, what is the business model and, and what type of um, roles do they have there? That always gives you, I think, a great indication of kind of like where they're at in their growth and kind of where they're going. Um, I think always look at the leadership team, kind of what do they look like? You know, I love what's that. diversity? Um, and is that kind of a leadership team that I feel like I could get on board with based on their backgrounds, how long they've been there and things like that. Um, and then, yeah, I think also just, build your network around that. Um, I always say to people, if there are certain companies that you want to to work for aspirationally, then you, you need to make that happen. It's not going to mm-hmm. just happen by, by waiting for a job advert. You need to connect with the right people. You need to, to tell them that you're interested. Um, I can't tell you how on fire my LinkedIn has been since I joined Tabby, which is amazing. Um, but I see that approach where people are like, I've been watching Tabby and I really want to work for Tabby. Like, how can you help me? And and obviously I can't help everybody, but I love that spirit. And I think that also yeah. stands out. So I love that. That's that's awesome. I think that building a network is always, I think, the the best way to go about it because you can mm. also get to know the people in the business. Do they resonate with with your your mission and, and what you're trying yeah. to accomplish? The fintech market is growing at this crazy rate. And we work in talent um, at our business, Talent in the Cloud, and talent seems to be a really big issue right now, just gaining the right talent. There's so many options out there. Do you have any solutions for this at Tabby? Um, I think the first one is acknowledging that. (laughs) Um, I think taking your like hiring managers and your leadership on that journey, um, you know, educating them that that attracting talent is really hard. And specifically, you know, in the last, well, gosh, you know, at least 10 years, the the talent market has become candidate driven, like no longer is it, you know, the candidates waiting for the employers, like, you have to go and like sell your soul sometimes to bring candidates yeah. on board. And I think just being open to, to having to go down that journey. But, but before that, that feels more reactive to me. I think proactively about building your brand and also, um, you know, being able to tell the right story, like authentically, but taking people on, um, you know, that journey that they know that when they come into Tabby, you know, they could go to any of our competitors, but if they come in at Tabby, this is what they're going to get that's different. That differentiator is is yeah. super important. Um, and I think also, like, again, being eyes wide open that we are competing with, like, financial services that have been around for a very long time. So, again, why come and work for Tabby rather than going and work for a bank or or an equivalent? And I think, again, what can we give from our cultural perspective and also our growth trajectory and where we are as a business and how exciting that part is, um, you know, bringing candidates into that, but equally 
distilling that story with internally within our own people because I think sometimes it's always left to the people function to to you know sell the dream and put the sugar coated piece on whereas I like <laughs> yeah. to start that right at the beginning because sometimes you know I might not be the first person to come into contact with a candidate and a, a hiring manager has for example and I feel like if they haven't got in there at the beginning with actually why why tabby at the beginning then sometimes it's always harder to to kind of sell that because it also feels like the sell at the end rather than more authentic at the beginning. I absolutely love your answer. I think we're trying to work alongside our clients and really teach them that because this is such a candidate driven market, you need to be so sure of how you would like to position your business. And as you said, Mm. if the hiring manager is going to be the first person there, they need training on the right things to say, what's the messaging you want to give? um, Why work for Tabby? But I think that what something we've been talking a lot about in when it comes to tech talent, we've had some mm. some clients ask the candidates to take a test on like before maybe their first interview or after one interview. And we're like, you can't do that anymore. That's just mm. not how that's just not <laughs> yeah. how it works. Someone's not gonna put like one to three to five hours into a project. No. They haven't even been bought into the business yet. So I think there's there, there really needs to be this massive mind shift, which I think mm. it's really tricky, right? Like you love your business and you know why people should want to work for it. And I think we always have seen interviews as you're drilling the candidate, but oh, times have changed. Mm. Oh, 100%. And, you know, I think I've faced, I face it more and more. And I think particularly when they're real talent, like they're the hardest ones to pull <laughs> over the line, right? Yeah. Um, and I completely agree with you where I've seen, you know, I've been in situations where people have said, yeah, no, I can do that case study, but um, uh, it costs you this amount of money because yeah. they're very yeah. they're very precious about your motive. And that means, well, we haven't sold our story to you properly then. Like mm. we've done something mm. wrong in that process. So I completely agree with you. Like, getting them in the right mindset, like you said, from a very early stage in the process and also creating that consistency of experience for the candidate. Um, Because again, you know, I might sell Tabby in one way and then somebody else comes in and creates, you know, as good a story, but different. And they'll be like, oh, there's not alignment there. So again, just real consistency and experience for the candidate is really, really important to me. Yeah. I think that employer branding as well, where mm. we currently have launched our own TikTok in our business, which is just oh, like cool. showing and showing our like personalities. And we're a really, I would say like goofy team. Um, and we want to show that and we want to show like when you join our business, mm. this is what it looks like. When you go onto someone's website, I know that when I was interviewing, the first thing I do is go onto all social medias, check what people are doing, check the types of people, what businesses did they come from? And I don't think people realize the importance of employer branding. Yeah. Branding. I love it when I see a business have like quotes or videos or mm. just sh- showcasing, I would say, the types of people that are in this business. Is there anything that Tabby's doing? Well, it's a great, a great question, actually, because it's something that is definitely on my 2022 radar. And I think I think Tabby has grown at such at such a rate and and clearly have brought me in for a reason. And I think part of that is, is showing the um, outside in, as I like to call it, which is you know, internally, we know what Tabby is and what it means to to work here and the connections that we have. But externally, that's probably not represented in the way that I would want it to be at the moment. Um, We've just had a massive rebrand. And like, in the next month or so, like employer brand is P1 for me. um, Because I think there are such easy wins that you can get by just kind of mobilizing your people around it and creating some of that, you know, really authentic content. Um, which shows the outside world what it really, really means to be part of Tabby. Um, So we're not there yet where I want us to be, but it's definitely a a priority for 2022 because I really believe, and and again, I'm preaching this internally, is that what we show um, to the external world is like, you know, almost 50% of someone wanting to say, I want to come and work there. Um, And coming to our website is not enough. Like, yes, our our website might be branded, but that doesn't tell you what it means to work here. It tells you what Tabby's trying to do and what mission we're on. Um, So, so yeah, no, I mean, watch this space. Um, I hope that over the next few months, the, the brand or the employer brand for Tabby really, really comes to life and is that like differentiator in such a competitive market to be fair. This is a conversation we're having um, with different clients. Like, do you set up your tech hub where your your HQ is? Do you go to a completely different country where there's maybe more talent? What are you guys doing at Tabby? 
Yeah, so we're in the, the thick of that at the moment, to be honest with you. Um, I think it's, like you say, uh, a conundrum for many um, businesses. And I think for many reasons, it's because, like you say, the shortage, but also the competitive landscape. Nobody wants to be where everybody else is because you're just constantly competing for the same talent. And if I come back to what I said earlier around it being a candidate's market, then you know that just exasperates the issue where you know, sometimes that loyalty might not always be there. Um, so you have to work, you know, doubly hard to get or attract and retain that same talent. So equally, you don't want to compromise on the level of talent. So you're in yeah. this tricky situation yeah. where you almost have to, you know, find gold and make sure nobody else knows where that gold is, which is, is not plausible. So for us, um, our strategy at the moment is um, being open to a remote tech team Mm -hmm. not having them all in one place um because we want to we want to have that you know flexibility versatility and variety of the kind of um different talent pools that we can um uh, look at uh we're looking at a couple of places in europe and we're also Mm -hmm. looking at asia at the moment as well okay um so we're, we're trying to find the best kind of model where um you know there is availability of talent, um, ability for us to work, um, I'd say efficiently just over time zones and language and things like that. Um, but we're definitely not necessarily building big hubs, but smaller, more kind of disparate and remote hubs. Um, and luckily for us, our tech team is also already used to working in a remote way. So that shift won't be too big. Um, it's just for us as a business to have, you know, more countries um to add to our complexity around if i look at it from a people lens again like you know just labor laws and employment laws and yeah and you know the the ability to um engage and drive that culture across lots of different locations so there's definitely an optimal num optimal sorry number where you know i I don't believe in oh we can recruit anywhere because a it's impossible like you need to have a focus and a strategy behind it Uh, And B, you need to be able to create enough people in one location that they don't feel isolated because I've, I've experienced that before where, oh yeah, we can hire anybody anywhere. And, and actually the reality of creating teams and connectedness is just super challenging. How do you choose where to build your next tech hub? You mentioned the need to speak English being one of them. I'm sure cost is taken into consideration, but how do you analyze the access to talent or the quality of candidates in that region? What does your analysis look like? So I guess for me, it's first of all, just that high level, like what's the industry saying about this country and location for tech talent? And you can, you can find that out through different ways, like um, our own internal employee networks and things like that. Oh, I know somebody or I know a company and, and all of that. Just really the high level stuff. And then Mm -hmm. I think when you you have found a couple of countries that are of interest to you from a strategic point of view, then it's about really, for me, I I like to go and find a local um, kind of either RPO or recruiter or agency where I know that they can just, um, you know, either validate or or invalidate my assumptions. And that's what we're doing in in one of the countries in Europe, for example. So, um, yeah, we're kind of working locally with that to say, look, these are the types of role that we're, you know, consistently recruiting for. Show us what you you think the talent market looks like there. And, you know, it's a mutually beneficial exercise because, you know, they're going to gain our business if they can convince us. And equally, you know, we're going to get some some top talent if they can, or we're going to know that we're not going to come there. So, um that for me is trying to do it yourself. I just think is um, not the best idea unless yeah. you, you know you have local local talent, and I mean talent acquisition people in these countries, which is going to mm. be unlikely. So partnering with I'd say credible companies uh, in order to demonstrate kind of your assumptions um, is probably the 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 way that we're well we're doing it that way, and, and I think it's it's proving fruitful because. You don't have anything to lose in that sense when you do it like that. Awesome. Kelly, thank you so, so much for being on the podcast. You did, you did phenomenally. Oh, thank you. It's been, it's been a really nice conversation actually. So thanks. I'm so glad you enjoyed it. Where's the best place for listeners to reach you? Um, yep. LinkedIn, um, 
definitely always active on LinkedIn. So yeah, if you want to um, get hold of me, talk further, then yeah, catch me on LinkedIn. Awesome. Thanks again, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Talking Success, Connecting the Global Fintech Community. Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn at Talent in the Cloud. And if you're interested in exec talent, expanding your team, or you yourself are looking for a new, exciting change in your career, check out our website, talentinthecloud.io.